Okay, um, I'm going to go on then um, and uh, introduce Winter Roth. Um, and I'm going to read exactly what uh, what uh, Leslie had. And those of you who are, have just joined, I'll just say this uh, with every new panel um, or every new presentation. Uh, our our uh, peace pres current peace president had a death in the family last night and ended up leaving in the middle of the night uh, to go to Mexico to be with family. So um, that's why she's not here. The technological part would be a lot more smooth if she were, uh, but <laughs> because she had it all planned out to a T. But, uh, but anyway, we're here and we're going to go on. Um, so Winter Raw, we now have three uh, former peace presidents logged in. Uh, Leslie would have been the fourth online at one time. But uh, anyway, Winter is a current second year pharmacy student at the University of California, San Francisco. She graduated from ASU in 2019 with a double major in biochemistry and psychology. While she was a student, she created both a business skills course. I know all this stuff. I don't know why I'm reading it, but and psychology course, which were taught at the Perryville prison. She also worked as a pen project intern and later co-instructor for two years, during which she took many trips to teach at the Globe prison and later uh, became president. Oh, she was a vice president and then later president of the piece. And currently she, um, she helps line edit Iron City Magazine and uh, and hopes to get back in some in-person stuff once COVID's over. Yeah, none of us can do that. So it's, it's kind of sad. And the prisons will open later, I'm sure, than everybody else. But uh, I think they probably like the amount of control they have over everybody right now, um, which is also another issue. But I don't want to go there. <laughs> um, so Winter, I turn the time over to you. She's going to moderate the... Uh, Arizona State University um, uh, Prison Education Panel. And uh, so she will introduce uh, those people and uh, I give it to you, Winter. Thank you, Corey. So I'll just jump into our first question. I don't want to talk about you guys when you guys can talk about yourself. We have a bunch of great, wonderful panelists today. So our first question is just to tell us a little bit about yourselves and your relationship to the prison system, especially education related. And we'll go ahead and start with Lindsay Saya, who asked our last question. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Lindsay Saya. I, um, I was incarcerated uh, for 15 years in the Arizona Department of Corrections. Uh, I went in when I was 20 and I was released uh, almost two years ago at the age of 35. Um, it was in uh, the Department of Corrections where I met uh, Dr. Wells, as well as several of the interns, including uh, Winter, uh, Lana, uh, and it was through the ASU workshops and the Penn Project where I started, oh, while, although I was educating myself, it was the Penn Project and the AC workshops that um, allowed me to believe that that education was worth something and that I was worth something. Uh, and, you know, so anyway, that's about 2016, I got involved with the AC workshops uh, and I started writing uh, primarily uh, focusing on uh, creative writing, and, um, you know, so that's, that was, as far as uh, prison and, and education, that's kind of a, a my background. Uh, and after my release, Corey actually convinced me to pursue uh, creative writing uh, in at ASU, and, and I did. And if it wasn't for Corey, I probably wouldn't have decided to go back to school. So now, currently, I am attending ASU, uh, pursuing a, a BA in English creative writing. Thank you, Lindsay. Lindsay was always willing to share whatever he was writing when we taught, which was greatly appreciated as an instructor. And he's just like a fantastic writer. So I'm so glad to hear that you're pursuing that. So our next panelist is the newly doctor, Colleen Wilkowski. Hi. And um so I am, I have been involved in the prison education program for 
since 2018. So I started off um, as a member of the Penn Project. And then afterwards, I taught um, at Perryville, the women's prison for, um, I think, three semesters. And then COVID happened. So I had to stop, which was a bummer. Um, but it was, it's was it been a great experience. I kind of got involved in um, prison education because I was learning a lot. Like I I was um, pursuing my PhD. I started in the third year of my PhD. And now I just, as as you said, I just finished my fifth. So, um, and final. So that's good. Um, so yeah, so I was learning a lot. Like I was doing my dissertation and a focus was the civil rights movement. So I was learning a lot about social movements. And I took a class on critical race theory and African-American rhetoric. And like, one thing that just kept coming up was like the impact that the criminal justice system has on people of color and people who live in poverty. And I just felt like I needed to do something. Like I was learning so much about all these social issues and I felt like I wasn't like doing anything to help. So then I saw Corey's email um, asking if anyone wanted to get involved in the Penn Project. And that's what initially made me sign on to the Penn Project. And the readings that we did there as like part of the course, we read a lot about um, the criminal justice system. Like one book that I'll always remember is Just Mercy. I'll recommend that to anyone who wants to learn about the criminal justice system. It's just so impactful. Um, and then reading the works of the students and giving them feedback, it just made me really passionate about prison education. And then the next semester, I decided to start teaching classes at Perryville, uh, which have been really excellent, like great teaching opportunity. I uh, Now that I'm on the academic job market, I just like kind of hope that my students, wherever I end up, are as good as the students that I had at Perryville, because they were just, they were just some of the best students I've ever um, had the pleasure to work with. So that's kind of my background. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wolkowski. Um, our next panelist is another former Peace President, Jess Fletcher. Hello, and good to see you all. Um, so as she said, I'm, I'm Jess Fletcher. Um, and just to give you guys an update too, I may have to leave a little early in this panel. So if I pop off, I'll, that's because I have another appointment to go to. Um, one of the reasons why is I work in the Valley as a licensed professional counselor. Um, and so I have an appointment following. In addition to that, I am um, part of Iron City Magazine, which is a nonprofit literary magazine, which I'm sure many of you have heard about or talked about so far earlier in today's uh, conference. And with Iron City Magazine, I am right now taking on the hat of operations director, though I have had many a hats. In the past, it was fiction editor. Um, and really before that, it got, um, I was started in prison education through Dr. Wells, as um, many of the teachers here, um, as a student. So when I was an undergrad, I had taken one of the courses um, with Dr. Wells for the Penn Project, and that really ignited my passion and interest as well. I have always been interested in understanding trauma and healing in communities and using creative endeavors to access that. And then once I fell into to this um, opportunity and world, it was uh, something that I couldn't stop. Um, I also think that prisons are a, sy a symptom of a larger uh, traumas in our society. And so it, it was a very much an appropriate fit for me to continue advocacy in this work. So I joined the Prison Education um, Awareness Club. I began volunteer teaching and I started out teaching as a assistant for a Psychology 101 course in Florence State Prison. And then later had the opportunity to co-lead a creative writing workshop um, as well. Um, right now I'm not currently teaching though I'm still part of Iron City and then um, really trying to navigate having more awareness of trauma healing from the therapist lens and having more therapists be aware of prison reform and PTSD mm -hmm. and all the layers, as well as uh, continuing in the education spaces and creative writing spaces. So that's a little bit about me. And Jess double majored in as an undergraduate before she specialized in, in uh, counseling as uh, creative writing with fiction, as well as psychology and a family and human development minor. And then my master's is in counseling. Thank you so much, Jess. Our next panelist is Olna Melnick. Um, Elena is how it, no, mm -hmm. don't worry about it. Um, 
Um, so I am currently an undergraduate student. I'm graduating this May, so I'm like about a month now, and I'm a history major. So I found out about the um, prison education program um, kind of through the people I was um, just friends with and had classes with. And um, I originally came in teaching uh, group teaching literature classes, and I continued doing that at both Iman and Perryville. And um, I kind of forgot the original question, but I think something um, that I've noticed uh, as people have been speaking is after you do this um, program and participate in it, it kind of alters um, your life direction in many ways. And I definitely think after I graduate, I'm going to um, stay involved in criminal um, justice work. And um, I am just found this opportunity so um, great and life changing. And um, I hope. Um, yeah, it's something I enjoy talking about and discussing and yeah. Thank you. Our next panelist is Grace Carlson. She was here. She might have. Hello. Been. Oh, you are I'm here. Good. Yep, I'm here. Good. I was afraid you got kicked off or something. Oh, yeah. You're on another, oh. another page for me. Yeah, great. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. Um, Hi everyone, um, I am currently one of the lead teachers of the School of Earth and Space Exploration Prison, Prison Education Program. Um, so we started teaching uh, a geology and astronomy class in Iman State Prison um, in the spring of 2019, I think. Um, so then we got to teach two full semesters and one kind of half semester. Um, because of COVID. And um, I got really interested in prison education after watching the documentary 13 um, and decided that I really wanted to do something about this problem of mass incarceration. Um, and then we found, about, found out about the ASU prison education program through uh, Corey and um, we also found out that there was this demand for more STEM classes in the prison. And so we thought, what a perfect opportunity um, to, to make a difference um, while also learning a lot about um, teaching because our program is totally graduate student run. Um, so we have, as graduate students, designed the course. And so it's been a really great experience. Um, and yeah. Thank you. And our next panelist is Lauren Paxton. Hi, I'm Lauren. I am a third year undergraduate student in psychology. Um, I previously taught or co-taught um, Gothic literature at Iman. Um, I taught psychology at Perryville and tutored in just like GED math at Adobe Mountain. Um, I first heard about the prison education program through just one of my acquaintances who had started teaching in a prison and really enjoyed it. Um, and then I asked Dr. Wells if I would be able to, um, just because I was interested in education, I love tutoring and I thought it would be a really cool experience, but it quickly became so much more than that to me. Um, I'm really interested, or I do a lot of research through the psychology department in substance use and like intergenerational transmission of substance use, just because that's something that's personal to me due to a family um, history of substance use. And being in prison, especially teaching psychology, has shown me that there's a huge overlap with the prison population is issues with substance use and criminalization of drug use, which I think is a huge problem. So that's kind of one of my interests. And being involved in the prison education program has kind of changed the entire trajectory of my career and what I want to focus in. Um, and I've learned so much from the people who have taken my class, and I hope that they've learned too from the class. So I'm really excited for this conference. And and I just want to say to our uh, audience that you and Elena both have taught at the men's prison, a men's prison. <laughs> it's not like there's one. Uh, <laughs> the women's prison, there is just one, and and the Adobe Mountain uh, School for Youth uh, Offenders. So uh, so you have. Um, so if you have questions about all any of those, um, please feel, I mean, if you are interested in differences between them, definitely direct some questions to them because they've had that whole body of, of places they've taught. 
And then I don't believe that I see um, Bootsy Martinez or Jeff Cronefield on the call, but if you guys are here, if you could holler. Yeah, I don't know where they are either. <laughs> okay, then let's just go ahead and move on to question number two. So if you all were given the option of making at least two big changes to either your teaching or learning experiences in the prison, what would they be and why? And we'll go ahead and start again with Lindsay. Um, well, I mean, it's, that one's hard to answer because a lot of it is dependent on um, the institution, right? The institution uh, of corrections. Uh, it's, but I would say I would want, anyway, the incorporation of technology, I think, yeah. is so vital uh, mm -hmm. to pursuing education, especially especially in a prison. There's just an infinite amount of information and something as simple as being able to connect to that information through the internet in a controlled, monitored way can affect someone, can, you know, you can bring so much information, right, to an individual, uh, especially someone like me who, who spent so uh, much time away. When you are released and you have little understanding of technology, one, and just uh, the world in general, I think that makes a big difference. And the other thing is, I, I think allowing more volunteers, more educational volunteers uh, to come to the prison um, and like these in-person, these workshops, those are so important and they give uh, prisoners a desire. Uh, it gives us something to look forward to, right? And so when we are learning, when you look forward to learning, it, it's something you, you, you want, right? It's something that you're going to take in and keep. It's not something that you just kind of like, oh, I have to do this and I'm going to read it and it goes, you know, in one ear and the other and out the other. So I think the, the incorporation of technology as well as having more of kind of these volunteers or having the system maybe search out for more kind of uh, educational volunteers, I think is so important. Thank you, Lindsay. It's a really good point too. Um, when I was teaching my business skills course, it was really difficult um, to teach the students to write resumes because they weren't allowed to type. They didn't have words. So we had to do handwritten things, bring those in for them. So that's a really, really good point that jogged my memory there as well. Now we'll go ahead and move on to our second panelist, Dr. Wilkowski. Uh, so to kind of go on with the, the theme of technology, I totally agree technology would help. Um, but specifically, I think that one thing that I would like to do going forward would be to use music in the classroom. I'm like very interested in music academically. I wrote my dissertation on um, music and its impact in social movements. And I have taught about popular culture in the prison, but I never actually brought the pop culture in with me. Like we do have to have like clearance if we want to bring in any sort of um like stereo or something that you'd play music on. Um, but this past year, just dealing with the pandemic and um, writing my dissertation and being on the job market, it's been a stressful year. And I've just really realized how like healing music can be. Like sometimes when you're just really in your own head, just like turning on music can help so much. Um, and I know like my stress is probably like so small compared to whatever the incarcerated women are going through. So I think just having music in the classroom as something that we could write about, something we could respond to uh, would be great because I do think music has, and I teach writing, so music has a lot of rhetorical elements to it. That could be a great teaching tool, but also just like the aspect of having music in the classroom could be really healing for them, I think. Um, and that's something that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later that I feel like these classes do in a way help these women to heal. I think that's, that's a great, uh, a huge aspect of the classes. And I think music can help that. Uh, one other thing, now that I'm kind of looking at it from the perspective of someone who's going on the job market, I would really like to try to like expand programs like this. So a lot of, because I'm so passionate about this program, I've looked into a lot of colleges that have service learning programs and they partner with different organizations. Um, and I think that if I had the opportunity to maybe like expand 
a person education program wherever I go, that would be a great opportunity. Or if I could stay involved through this new um, lantern system that Nala was talking about earlier today, um, that would be great. But just like, I don't know, those of us who are um, maybe continuing in an educational career, finding a way to keep expanding programs like this, I think is so important uh, going forward. Thank you so much. Uh, next panelist would be Jess Fletcher. Right, thank you. Yeah, so in some ways, kind of echoing a little bit of what um, both um, Lindsay and Colleen had just mentioned, um, part of it is my biases coming in as a, a therapist. I'm always thinking from this lens of, of trauma and people and what actually facilitates change. And also what does that mean in the context of education? Um, so I think what would be really cool going forward is for there to be um, training for teachers on how to one, do their own work for understanding power and privilege and implicit bias, systemic racism and oppression, um, and also just the power dynamics that come up in a situation where you're an educator, student and teacher, um, because it's, it's important in general. It's important in those relationships, but it's even more important in the context of prison where there's a lot of dynamics around power and uh, control and safety. Um, and I think that it really speaks to like, if we are providing education, how are we doing so in a way that really will um, allow and facilitate for education to be absorbed? Because giving information like that's great and um, doing so in a way that someone can hear and really meet somewhere they're at, I think is even more important and critical. Um, and think in order to do that, that requires us um, as people who want to volunteer to also be willing to have discomfort and own our mistakes. For example, like if I'm talking about hashtag and the person I'm you know, teaching is like, I have been in prison for 25 years. What are you talking about? I don't know what an iPhone is. Like, I think having to have those conversations and being willing to be in discomfort as well as bring some humor and lightheartedness and willingness to confront things important. Um, I think that it's also really key to talking about these dynamics and how to own your own values, especially since they might be very different than the values of the system um, and having to navigate that and how hard that is. Um, I think what's really neat though is when those conversations can be had and we can start from there, it changes the way that we are operating as educators and facilitators. Um, that it's not just about, I'm the expert, let me give you information, but also being someone who's willing to receive information and learn and grow as well. That I think about that as a therapist and as a teacher that I am I am like, yeah, I've got a scope, I can share this and I'm learning from you along the way as well. And that's okay and I wanna model that in a way that is still appropriate and has healthy boundaries and is human. Um, I think that that can be those seeds that the panel before was talking about as well because then it's about having a healing relationship and that's going to help someone's nervous system especially if they've been navigating all of these very distressing relationships throughout their entire life to have a little seat of like okay here's what education can maybe be different here's how it may be um it's still going to be hard right but this piece maybe is possible um maybe it's not that i'm bad right and really thinking about shame too as well um and I think that's another thing to be aware of for educator educating as well is um, mm -hmm. how much shame and stigma and trauma there is around education. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if we aren't aware of that, we can come in and sometimes even do more damage. And so I, that's why I think it's so incumbent mm -hmm. for um, volunteers to be aware of that. And I think it's totally possible and doable and I'm happy to facilitate and always talk through that too. Um, I've seen the change happen, even when I was able to navigate them, be like, oh, just like, <laughs> well, be aware. Um, and I could tune differently to my, my students. Um, and it brought out a lot of conversations around um, needing to shift the agenda to talking about like death and loss. Um, sometimes it was having to talk about what does it mean to feel safe to even give feedback to someone, especially in a creative writing group, because that's a lot of dynamics. Um, so I think those are some of the pieces I, I would add to um, things to, to consider when going into teaching in a prison or teaching in general. Thank you so much, Jess. 
Next up is Olena. Um, yeah, I, I think um, the longer, to go off your points, um, the longer I kept, um, I was teaching, the more I was willing to um, give back control to the like students in my class to um, kind of have some control over the direction the class is going, what kind of activities they like, what kind of readings they want to uh, doing. Because like Corey mentioned, I taught Gothic literature. So um, I wanted it to be, I like we chose that topic. So it would be interesting for the students and letting them have control over what they were learning, how they were learning, I think um, was definitely a positive in the classroom. Um, but um, going back to like what I would ideally want to change about this process is I, I agree that having um, access to technology would be a big help. Even something as simple as a PowerPoint or like a video that you want to teach in class mm -hmm. or just show in class, um, it's kind of limiting in ways that you wouldn't expect when you are planning the material. And then the other thing that I would ideally want to change is I wish that um, the staff inside of the prison were um, were more receptive um, to what we were doing. Because I mean, and not to say that they weren't, I've had amazing positive experiences with individuals who work in inside the prisons, but, and I wouldn't even say I had a negative experience, but just sometimes the apathy that we um, kind of are faced with where um, it's like the program isn't really being facilitated and its potential isn't really being harnessed. I feel like that's something that um, I would want to change because um, I think just making this an easy process for the teachers would enhance this and the facilitators and the organizers would enhance the program and allow it to continue and reach more people. So um, yeah, those are kind of my thoughts. Thank you so much. Next, we'll turn it over to Grace. I 100% agree on the technology aspect. Um, that is probably the biggest thing, especially in a STEM class. Um, having access to technology, I think, would change so many things about what we're able to do and the topics that we're able to cover in the class. Um, that's part of the reason I'm really excited for this on kind of online uh, lantern program um, using the tablets because we can just put so much more material um, on the tablets than we could ever bring into the classroom. Um, and so, Although we're missing this face-to-face -face interaction with the students, which I also think is really valuable, um, it does give us the ability to um, add more content um, and kind of go more in depth into cer certain topics. Um, something else that I would change is I think I just wish we could have more of like everything. I wish we could have more time with the students. I wish it was, there was a lower barrier to entry for some volunteers. Um, I wish we had more support in the prison for these classes. Um, yeah, I think just more of everything across the board is, would be great. Thank you. And our last panelist for this question is Lauren. Um, this is like kind of a hard question for me because um, I can think of a lot of things, but I think I really agree with Lindsay's point about access to technology in the class. I think that that would really help with a lot of the modules I was doing if I was able to like play videos or um, show like a PowerPoint. But also just because I've had a lot of people in the class say, I have questions about the specific thing that we talked about. What can I do to learn more about it? Um, like very like, like just individual people's questions. Um, and I think it would be really helpful with instead of me being like, oh, next week, I'll bring back more information about that that you can read or maybe go check out the library and see if there's books about that. If I could direct them to online resources that they could read like immediately mm -hmm. um, and that might be able to lead them down under other paths of interest. I also think that's something um, that I personally would want to change, like about my method of kind of teaching um, is something that I did not do at all in I'm in, in the literature class um, or yeah, very minimally, but something that I did start to do in Perryville. And that was talking about how what we're learning in the class can be applied to like 
their specific interests or their career goals or education goals. Um, I think it's really important to get feedback and that's something that I always try to do um, from students like at the end of each month having them write like things that they wish we could talk about more. Um, and one of the big things in my Perryville psychology class was a lot of students wanted to talk about the different careers in psychology, different classes that would help them go further, um, whether it was classes that were taught or classes they would be able to take at a community college or ASU. Um, and I always tried to talk about that even if we were gonna get behind on the lesson plan, having group discussions, um, especially since my classes are like more seminar based. Um, I think that was really important and that's definitely something I wanna do having like career modules or modules about how can this impact your personal life? Um, Cause I think that's a really important thing that we might not talk about too much, especially if it seems like it doesn't really apply. Like how is literature or psychology going to apply to your personal life? I think that there are definitely ways that it could. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Even, even for lifers, you know, even for lifers. But the, the, the truth is that 95% of all prisoners will be released at some point. It's just that so many go back because their options are so limited when they get out. And uh, so I think that focus on technology, but also on the life skills that you're talking about uh, are, are really important. Um, yeah, I can't imagine coming out after 15 years and trying to address technology. It was hard for me when I was there when it started, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm sick of it, to be honest. I don't want to know any more technology, but I have to, you know, to work and be part of the world. But to come out of prison and not know any of it, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine that. That would be so daunting. And so the audience, if you guys have any questions or anything, feel free to throw them in the chat at any time so that we can address them. Um, but we'll go ahead and move on to question number three. So from your guys' experience, what are student attitudes towards educational programming in the prisons? And first up is Lindsay again. Um, <clears throat> well, I think in general, I think there's a desire uh, there's definitely a desire there uh, from most prisoners. Um, however, I think that desire is it's often stifled by uh, the correctional institution. Um, I think that prison becomes this kind of place of reflection, self-reflection, uh, self-discovery. Uh, you, you want to know you begin to ask questions, right? And when you ask questions, you want to know. And when you want to know, that that starts the path of, of education, right? You want to know. So there, it, if the opportunities were there, majority of prisoners, I think, would, would want to seek it out. If it's there, they want to sign up. I don't know how many times I've been in a prison and we catch wind of a new program that might uh, start up, whether it's learning how to lay brick, uh, some kind of uh, you know construction program, it doesn't matter. Those sign-up sheets get filled up really fast. And before you know it, you know some people made it in, some people didn't. And the point being is that there isn't enough programs, but there's a, there is a substantial amount of desire there. So I think from the prisoner point of view, you know, it, we want to learn and we want to become better because once you're in a prison, you, you start to understand the position you are, I think, in life. And you know that there you have to find something better for yourself. But those opportunities just aren't there. And most of it is because the prison system just isn't willing or doesn't believe in it, I think. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, next up is Dr. Wilkowski. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with uh, what Lindsay was saying. I think that there's a huge interest. The unit that I was teaching in, in uh, at Perryville, the women always told me that they wished there were more classes available in their unit because they said there was another unit that they just happened to put the classes on the other unit more. Um, but they were always saying that they wish there was more classes. They wish there was more classes. They would take as many classes as possible. Um, and 
I think that, yeah, there's definitely that desire to be enrolled in classes, but there's just not enough opportunity. And to me, it's so crazy that they did like the system doesn't make it more of a priority because the change that you see happening in those classes, I teach writing. So I usually, I have some women who ha have enrolled in all of my classes because they stay with the, the classes. So I try to make them unique every time, but I try to do a mixture of like personal, reflective, creative typewriting and then more academic style writing. So they're getting those like academic skills that they need if they want to pursue further education, but they also have like time to reflect. And the change that you see happening over the course of the semester with that that type of class, that type of writing is, it's just phenomenal. And it's, it gives them a time to reflect. And there, there've been so many times where I give them the opportunity to, um, to share their writing. And it's just very cathartic sometimes to be able to share their writing, especially on personal essays, because the personal essay, some women will choose to reflect on a time before they were in prison. And I feel like it really connects them to that person that they are, that they maybe forget about because of the place that they've been put in and the fact that they're treated as a number. They kind of forget that there's a person with lived experiences outside of this building. And just uh, re recollecting that in the form of writing can be really helpful. Also, some women will talk about how they ended up in prison and just retracing that and retracing the kind of trauma that they face because they all have faced trauma can also be like very helpful. And it's just kind of like a safe space where people can share. Um, and I know that's kind of unique to a writing class and that we could be academic and kind of personal at the same time. But I think any sort of education is going to help these uh, incarcerated people to grow, not only as, as students, but as people. Great, thank you. Um, next up is Jess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in my experience, um, very similar to what um, was said before, um, students were extremely excited and engaged to participate. Um, and it was very different than my experience teaching like freshman and sophomore courses at ASU, a very different level of engagement. Um, and I think part of it had to do with the fact that it was, um, it's optional, right? It was not required, it was all self-selected. Um, and that there, there were very few um, programs, I think, at that time as well, or just uh, limited space, too. So it would be, always be a wait list. Um, and so the students were incredibly engaged. And, and usually the response was, can you give us more? And we're like, OK, we already have a packet of like 30, 40 pages. But like, sure, let's add another short story. And why not? Um, and we made it work. We were very creative of how we would um, be able to enhance those materials and we're really open about okay here's what we have capacity and time for and here's mm -hmm. what we can do to, to really meet that um i mean there was days when um we would always have like a little break and people would be like hey can we can we work through the break can we have a longer we can do like a full day let's do like a four hour I'm like i think we'll all get a little burnt at that point and just really that was that was like the general consensus um uh, it was exciting. It was engaging. Um, what I thought was so neat too is uh, a mm -hmm. lot of people would talk about like, okay, here's how I remember it was when I learned it in school. And now this is so different than like when we're talking about it now, like we had this great conversation and I cannot for the life of me remember what was said in this one class, but I remember just the feeling because um, we were laughing so hard and having a whole conversation around like M dashes, like who knew that M dashes could like bring an entire class, you know, belly laughing, um, but it's possible. Um, and so that was generally the, the my experience of it um, was, oh, and another one I'll share is in the psychology course, uh, we were talking about like neural pathways and um, the dendrites, which is like the little end pieces of the neuron. And so we do the dance, the dendrites. And we were all like, having our arms like dancing and like doing this and you have a bunch of people moving and doing something weird like that. And it just diffuses all the tension and just immediately or just feel comfortable, safe, connected. It changes how we interact with education. Um, so I was having a lot of fun. I, it was my favorite day of the week to go. Um, I miss it all the time. And my experience from the feedback, I can't speak for them, but just from what I heard, um, was that it was it was a really enjoyable neat um experience with education 
my experiences regarding that, you, you said the connection and the release of tension is that there's an immense amount of r- racial tension inside the prisons. And the classes are the one place where I think students generally, our classes at least, feel safe to, to uh, interact with uh, across each other across the racial divides uh, in the prisons, and then maybe when they walk out, they have to assume whatever again. I don't know, Lindsay, you could tell me more about that. Uh, maybe you will speak to that, but um, but I think that it allows it allows them to be human beings, not just, you know, the Crips or the whatevers, you know, I don't know all the group names, but they still exist inside the prisons, so. Actually, I love that you you mentioned that, Corey, if it's okay if I add one more thought, right. um, because that was a big thing. We would talk about it. I would just be very upfront about it and, and see if people felt comfortable and safe, make sure that we had the, the containment. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to hide the fact that I'm a young white woman. Um, and so we am like, oh, cat's out of the bag, surprise. Um, <laughs> and I kind of frame it like that too. And people are like, are like oh, Jess, um, well, that, they call me Miss Fletcher, but that's Another note. Um, and there was communication around that because it also, I would uh, allow and like have opportunities for people to move around the room and shift. And so especially we would even like be really deliberate about how we had the room uh, organized for workshop spaces. And I would start to notice as the class moved on and the safety was built, people were sitting in very different spaces and there was a lot of different um, interactions. Um, And we actually even had a whole conversation where we talked about it because during a workshop, um, it got a little heated because there was different um, thoughts and kind of experiences around um, someone sharing a memoir around growing up in a trap house. And what initially came as something being heated became a really cool opportunity for us to talk about um, empathy and compassion. We had to first have safety. And then it was like a hey, anyone else who has never been raised in a trap house and I was doing that sort of thing. And again, humor, Mm -hmm. but it was also a sense of like, hey, I but and I wanna hear and understand Mm -hmm. um, if you feel okay sharing and choose to. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was a really neat piece um, to note too, is that it allowed for, um, I think our students to really connect with each other very differently. Again, I can't speak for them, uh, but that was just something that I had had observed. Lindsay, can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, um, Well, I think that, yes, within those spaces, uh, those education spaces, those workshop spaces, I think it does become kind of one, a safe place that doesn't that exists i think outside of our rules our prison rules uh and the culture that we've created for ourselves uh the oftentimes dangerous culture that we've created for ourselves um i think those spaces are places where as a prisoner we we enter with a goal to learn or to attain something different than what we're getting on the yard. And I think because of that, and don't get me wrong, there's still tension that is brought sometimes. I, I'm sure you've all felt it that is brought to those workshops. And there's still, I mean, you can't just abandon that, right? When you walk through the door. But in my experience, it, it becomes a place where you can abandon it for the time being, right? And we both, uh, everyone there prisoner wise understands that the second we leave you know we have to begin to operate under those prison rules again but for that brief moment you know we're we're students and and we're learning and we can i think normalize ourselves a bit uh now every yard is different you have you know uh, higher yards, higher security yards and minimum yards. Um, I was fortunate enough, I guess, to take some of these workshops in the more uh, minimum yards. Um, So I think some of those prison rules were more readily like abandoned, I think, when we stepped into the the classroom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'd just love to comment too on everything that everyone was saying about the the increased participation. And I definitely saw that when I taught versus teaching, you know, ASU students in person. And now I teach virtually online via Zoom and everyone mutes, turns their camera off and you try and get participation. It's just like shouting into the nether and no one says anything. So it's just a completely different story now too. So that's just another layer that I wanted to comment on as well. Um, Elena, did you have anything to add for this question? Um, yeah, well, I guess really quickly, I agree with everything everyone said, but I think um, it works. I think it's a benefit that we're all volunteers that come that don't usually interact um, with incarcerated people or prisoners because we bring in a whole different like tone and kind of like energy to the classroom and I think it's um helpful for us to not have been um like I don't know I, like over time I kind of picked up on the more, more like institutional knowledge that like you just know about like COs and stuff like that and I think it helps coming in as an outsider and kind of not bringing in any bias and like coming in there and treating um your students in a completely different way than they've been treated for um, like their time in the um, prison system. So I think there's a lot to be said about improving like the educational opportunities and hiring teachers in prisons, but I really do like that factor of our program. Thank you. And Grace, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I agree with what everyone has said. <clears throat> I think these classes are really high in demand. We've actually had uh, students retake our class just mm -hmm. because there was not another science class that was offered. Um, on top of that, uh, students come in all the time with either questions because we're teaching a lot about, you know, the natural world and uh, astronomy too. And so students all this time are coming in with questions and we just, you know, I think this is like a safe space where they can they can ask any question about, you know, the environment they're around, or especially about um, Arizona geology. We teach a lot of Arizona geology, um, and it's I've always thought of it kind of um, as a break, I think, for our students, where you know they have this time where. Um, they can really explore their curiosities and kind of voice their curiosities um, when otherwise they maybe don't have opportunities to do that. So. Or they don't want to show off their uh, vocabularies if they happen to be more, you know, learned than their, their peers or, you know, they don't have to talk in F words every two seconds and I think that's what at least some of them have told me. So I, I don't know, Lindsay, again, you could say, but because, <laughs> you know, you know, we don't really know. We're just there and then we're gone, you know? Yeah, I think in the classroom. Yeah, I think people, I mean, all the time the students come in and say, like, I saw this on Nova, like, what do you think of this volcano in blah, blah, blah place, you know? And uh, yeah, they're definitely not afraid, I think, to kind of nerd out with us sometimes. Mm, mm -hmm. And last but not least, Lauren, do you have anything to add? I don't have a ton to add just because I agree with what everyone said. Um, but this question kind of makes me think like, I love the fact that people who were in the class were able to make so many connections. Um, like for example, in the psychology class, the two TAs also, led like a peer group about substance use um, for women on the unit. Um, and a lot of the disorders that we covered in class were like comorbid with substance use. And so they would ask me after class, like, oh, do you have more information on that? Like, can we talk about this more? Would you be able to bring in like more research or how can I look into this? And I thought that that was really amazing that they were able to like make those connections, even people who made connections across like different disciplines or different fields, like people who took information that we talked about in the psychology class and said, how would this apply to like social psychology? Um, how would this apply to sociology? I thought it was really amazing. Um, and I also agree with people talking about participation or making it seem like a safe space. Um, my classes are structured like a seminar. Um, so it's just basically like a discussion. Um, 
people are always free to ask questions, like not raising hands. And then we do group projects or group discussions. Um, and I don't think there was a single person who didn't give their thoughts every class or didn't ask questions. Um, that was really amazing. And then I guess just like one last thing, sorry. No, um, do it, do it. Um, in both my classes, this wasn't so much for Adobe, but um, my class at Perryville for psychology and then literature I'm in, um, if there were words that people didn't know, I would just, at first they would look them up in the dictionary, but then I started just making like a kind of index of words that are not commonly used in their definitions. So people would be able to go through them while reading. And I noticed in both classes, people would then start to use the words from the vocabulary, vocabulary list in their like later assignments. Um, and I thought that was really cool. Like, I know I definitely would not have the discipline to have a dictionary and go through while I'm reading and looking up words in the dictionary um, or using words that I had previously learned from another assignment in my new assignment. So I thought that really just showed like their passion for the subject and also kind of helped them learn or not help them learn, but kind of showed them that even though these classes might not relate to their everyday life, it still is helpful for learning how to write or learning how to incorporate new vocabulary or learning how to look things up. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and I think one one th comment I want to make, and then I won't say another word during this because it's almost it's time to to, to move on. But um, is that a lot of the volunteers going in? If you all want to do this, you need to contact Nala or me. Um, and uh, a lot of the volunteers going in. Uh, are now going to have students who are as old as their grandparents and their parents and yet they're so grateful to have you there that they are they're just thrilled to have you and they are humble and they are helpful uh if you feel weird you know they make you feel so comfortable oh don't worry about it honey blah 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 you know they're they're uh they're just incredibly encouraging you know uh, so if anybody wants to do this kind of thing in your major, teach a class, volunteer, yeah, you get three hours of cre uh, internship credit for doing it. But, but yeah, we'd be happy to facilitate it when, when the classes come back in, in session again, in person. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for any questions from the audience, Corey, or do we need to wrap up? Um, we have about... Well, I think we could spend maybe, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I want to make sure everybody does, can do it. Um, Jess might have to leave. I realized that because um, uh, she, <laughs> she's a practicing therapist, our counselor. I mean, that's what she's got to do. But uh, yeah, uh, take, take a question or two. If you want to do it, why don't you just talk? Unmute yourself and talk. Yeah, if there's any questions, feel free to unmute or chat them. I had a comment that I think that the uh, the uh, the COs, the corrections officers, i.e. guards, uh, they don't like to be called guards in Arizona, but um, I think they all need to have degrees. And the reason I'm going to say that is because sometimes they're jealous that they're jealous that the prisoners are getting these classes and that's why they're snide about it. Sometimes some of them are incredibly supportive. Uh, and, and I didn't, I haven't met very many rude people in the prison myself, but I haven't spent as much time as some of you all have. And uh, you've met more rude people or apathetic people at best, you know, and, uh, but some of them are incredibly uh, managed to keep their humanity, uh, you know, varies from individual to individual. So yeah, our next speaker is here. She's here, Nala. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Carol's here. I, I've seen her. Yeah, she's here. Yep, here I am. <laughs> yep, yeah. She's on another page. We have two two pages of participants now. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. if there's no questions, then I'd like to thank all of our panelists for your great wisdom and comments today um, and taking the time to speak with us. You were all fantastic. So thank you so much.